Hey Internet, it's your old friend Dominic here with the All American Casino Guide, a channel dedicated to providing you all the tips, tricks, tutorials, and trivia that you need to know about casinos and casino games. While you're at it, make sure to subscribe to the channel because you certainly don't want to miss any of the exciting videos that we have coming in the near future. So this episode is dedicated to pre-flop strategies. If you don't already have a fundamental understanding of the game of Texas Hold'em, we recommend that a good starting point would be to go back and watch our introductory video to the game of Texas Hold'em so that you understand how it's played on a larger scale. Uh, so as an introduction to the game and pre-flop strategies, another important thing you we're going to talk about is the four stages of betting. So every round of Texas Hold'em is made up of four betting rounds. There is the pre-flop round, which is the initial round, and then the flop round, the turn round, and finally the river round that all occur before the potential showdown where players will need to reveal their hands in order to win the pot. What that would look like would be something like this. You'd get your first two cards and you would bet just on the strength of these two cards and then in the flop round, you would reveal three cards into the community pool, and then based on the strength of these cards and your hold cards, would determine your betting strategy, and then you have a burn and turn for a turn card, and a burn and turn for a river card. So you have a four total betting rounds, one pre-flop, one after the flop, one after the turn, and one after the river. So the first thing that you need to consider is the strength of your hold cards. As the first round of betting, the pre-flop round of betting, you are only going to have the strength of those two cards to go on to determine if you want to call the big blind, raise the big blind, or even potentially fold and get yourself out of the hand. Uh, great hands are always, of course, pairs. So the best pair you could possibly be dealt is a pocket aces. All right, but. A fallacy is to believe that just because you were dealt uh, two aces that you're automatically going to win. Um, of course, pair of kings. Uh, these are known as bullets. The kings are known as cowboys. Um, also, connected suitors like this, high value cards, queen and jack, but they're also the potential for a straight draw. Um, of course, ace, king, AK is the best uh, cards that you could have where these have the best, this is called a builder hand because you have the potential of getting a king or an ace out of the five community cards and build yourself at least a decent pair. Um, suited, not, uh, suited connectors, in this example, eight and nine, this is a pretty good example because you have the potential for a straight. You also have a good potential for a flush. Um, and then even high card value, uh, high value cards like a, qu a queen and a 10 that aren't suited, this is still the potential for a good hand. Anything under eight, if you have two cards where the two cards um, are under eights, then you do not have a good hand. Um, and this is gonna determine a lot. So if you have, for example, two, three, and they're not suited, uh, that is not a good hand. If you have six, five, seven, five, even 10, four, those are not good hands. But they can become good hands, but, you, but just based on the strength of your hold cards, you have to be considerate of how your betting strategy works, okay? The next important point is position is everything. So what's important to note is that there are three players that are important to know where they are at any given time of a game of Texas Hold'em, and that is the dealer player, the small blind, and the big blind, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and deal five, five players out onto the board, all right? Let's just see what they get. So. The small blind in this case is gonna be $5, and the big blind is going to be 10. When you are the first player to act, you have to typically play a little bit more conservatively. It's very necessary because you have too many other players who have yet to act. So if you throw your chips in, you could suck yourself in by accident. Now, this player will, will reveal their hand. Obviously, they wouldn't reveal it to the table, but they would know that they have a six and a three. Now, as I've established, this is a very bad opening hand. Uh, you have very little options here. The best you can hope for is maybe, uh, well, I mean, you could hope for four of a kind, uh, but the, the truth is, or even a, uh, but you're not gonna be getting any sort of straight flush. It's a very unlikely possibility, okay? So from the pure strength of this hand, I'm gonna say this is a weak hand, and this player is best uh, advised to drop out of the hand altogether. Um, unless, of course, they are the chip leader, and they want to see uh, if their hand turns into anything. 
But as I said, a player who's playing right off the big blind is at a disadvantage because of their position and they should play conservatively. So we're gonna say this player drops out of the hand. Then we have this player who gets to see that they have seven and four. These are suited, so we have the potential for a flush. Um, this player can play a little bit more loosely because it now this player no, no, now knows that this uh, first player to act has decided to already drop out of the hand. So maybe this player thinks, yeah, I got the potential for a hand, but I also want to try to scare some of the other players out. So they decide to actually raise. So they're going to call the initial bet of $10, and then they're going to double it. Now, the dealer has got to see these other two players and what they uh, have done. So you can already get some information about the strength of hands out there. This player didn't believe in their hand at all. This player believes in their hand quite a bit. Now, I see that I have a pair of sixes. Now, a pair of sixes... There's a great potential that this hand could turn into something, but at the end of the day, it's just a pair of sixes. Now, do I think that that's worth $20 bet? For the sake of, of uh, this example, I'm gonna go and say it, it is. Now we have, finally, the small blind. Now, normally the small blind would just have to double their initial bet, but because the bet had been raised by the second player to act, uh, the now they're gonna have to put 15 more dollars in if they wanna play this hand, which, as we reveal, is a queen and 10, a pretty good hand overall. So they're gonna go ahead and agree, put uh, 15 more dollars in, so they're gonna match the bet of these two players. Now the last to act, of course, was the player who had the most uh, to lose initially because they had, to they had to blindly bet the big blind, which was $10 initially. So they're gonna show they have pocket aces. Now this player is in the greatest position of all because they have gotten to see what all the other players think about their hands and so now they have a tough decision to make. Do they simply just match the bet, or do they try to suck some more chips in? Now this player feels very confident about their aces, so they're actually, and they want more money from the other players, or even potentially to get the other players out of the hands because they've already telegraphed that they at least believe uh, in their hand a little bit. So I'm gonna actually say that this player is going to raise the pot even further. They're gonna double their bet from $20 to $40. And then this player, seeing that seven and four diamonds, there's a, they have a bit of an uphill battle, they're gonna go ahead and get scared, fold out of the hand. This player with a pair of sixes believes in those sixes, maybe six is their lucky number, and they're gonna go ahead and double their bet as well to $20. But this player, who's sitting with nothing but a queen and a 10, thinks, man, I, this is a little too risky for me, maybe I don't have the chips for it, they're gonna fold their hand as well. Let's see how this plays out, all right? So, now we've finished the first round of betting. Uh, now we have to move to the second round of betting, which is known as the flop round. We have the dealer burn the top card of the deck and deal three fresh new cards. Okay, so, uh, as this is the dealer, the first to act was the old big blind, um, who is going to have the first decision to make. They can look at their hand and see that they have a pair of aces and a pair of jacks on the board. Now there's also a queen. There's, this, is, this is looking pretty good for them. They, they know that they have the best hand right now, or at least they can suspect they have the best hand at two pair, but there's always the potential that one of these other players have been dealt a jack or even a jack queen, and they're sitting on a, on a full house right now. So this player thinks, yes, I have a good hand, but I wanna wait to see what the other player does first. So this player right here thinks to themselves, okay, I, that player checked, uh, I have a pair of sixes and a pair of jacks. Um, I feel pretty good about it. I'm gonna go ahead and bet at least the big blind, which is $10, and see if this player believes in their hand enough to keep playing. And they do. So we're gonna see the number, the, 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 the play match up, and they're gonna go ahead and move to the third round of betting, which is the turn round. Again, the dealer burns the top card of the deck, reveals a new card again. Oh, wow, this is getting pretty interesting pretty quick. This player, the big blind player, is still the first to act because they are still the first player still in the hand that is directly right of the dealer. Um, so they have to hold in their excitement right now. They have to play smart because right now they're sitting on a very dominating um, full house. They have three aces and two jacks. Now there's very little chance that this player has any hope of having a better hand than you. 
Essentially, when you have a full house, the only thing you're really afraid of is the potential that this player is actually got two jacks in this particular situation. Because if this player is holding a pair of jacks, then that means that they have four of a kind. So again though, you can't play conservatively all the time and there's only two players in the hand. So based on what you know about this player's play style and their, their uh, propensity to bluff and also how you feel from a gut standpoint, you're gonna bet heavy at this point because you wanna get them out of the hand or you wanna get as much of their chips as possible. So you're gonna bet $60, uh, which is essentially uh, a little bit more than what you've already committed to the pot. Um, and so this player then, seeing that they have two, just a pair of sixes and a pair of jacks, they're gonna realize that there's too many potential possibilities that somebody's gonna have a better hand than them. Because all they need at this point is a player, this player to have an ace or a queen, and they've already beat my pair of sixes and jacks. So I feel that $60 is a far too heavy of a bet and we're gonna go ahead and fold this hand. That would be my best piece of advice to give in this particular situation. But for the sake of this example, we're gonna go ahead and say this player feels very brave and they also don't understand the mathematical probability that is, uh, should be ringing in their ears at this point in time, telling them, get out of this hand, you have a very little chance of winning it. So they're gonna go ahead and say they have a lot of chips to burn. They're gonna go ahead and put that $60 bet in and we're gonna finally see the game enter into the fourth and final round of betting. We're gonna burn the top card, reveal a final last river card. In this case, it's a two of spades. Uh, we've checked the board. There's no threat of a flush draw, but there is certainly a threat of a uh, full house. Um, so then again, we go back to this player who's been sitting the entire game since uh, with a good hand, with at least two pairs since the beginning of the game. Um, now they're sitting on a full house as I've established. This is their chance to go all in. We'll say they only have another hundred dollars left. Uh, and then this player is gonna have to, you know, finally make that tough decision. And they're probably gonna realize that a hundred dollars is too much for them and they're going to decide that they're chasing after, they're, ch they're not trying to protect their chip stack anymore. They would just be flushing more money down the table. They're gonna go ahead and fold the hand. They know when to fold them. They know when to hold them. And quite frankly, this is the time to get out of the hand. Uh, obviously, if you fold, you won't have a chance to see what that player was holding uh, unless they choose to reveal that hand, which brings me to a great point. I say this once, I've said it twice, I'll say it three times. Never ever reveal your cards unless someone is paying to see them. So if this player folds, you kindly uh, collect your winnings and you never reveal the fact that you had two aces the entire time. You know you had the best hand. Why do you need to tell the rest of the table you did as well? My third and final point involves less a mathematical analysis of probability and a bit of more of the, what makes the game unique is the social aspect. Um, you can read players' tells. You want to see how they react. You want to see how they bet. Uh, after playing several rounds of Texas Hold'em with any particular group of people, you should start getting a general idea of their play style, um, especially if you've played against them on multiple occasions uh, or you know them from by reputation. So pay attention to those early rounds where they bluffed or certain rounds where they slow played. Don't be afraid to go heavy and aggressive early pre-flop. Like I said before, this is a great way to push out players who don't feel that they don't have a good hand. Non-confident players will fold very quickly uh, against any sort of re-raise. So if you, if you see a player and they raise you and you think there's a distinct possibility that they're bluffing, go ahead and re-raise them. Don't simply call them because then you get the opportunity to let them see free cards. Never allow your players to see free cards unless you yourself are in desperate need to see some new cards to see if your hand improves at all. Um, this is, after all, a game where you need to play a lot of hands to learn it efficiently and to have any sort of mastery of it. So play for thousands of hours to truly understand the game. Um, if at first you're worried about losing large sums of money, try to play at lower stakes. You'll be happy in the long run that you learned and cut your teeth at a much lower price point. So that concludes an introductory guide to pre-flop betting in Texas Hold'em. 
Uh, make sure to check out the rest of the videos on our channel. We have other videos that are more advanced guides to betting strategies for a variety of different games. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and leave a comment down below and slam that like button. And if you haven't already, go ahead and slam that subscribe button too. It's the only way that you're guaranteed to not miss a single episode that we put up on the channel. My name's Dominic. This is the All-American Casino Guide reminding you guys, play responsibly.